All right, hi, I'm Fluffy, and hi. this is my presentation. So, my first point. <laughs> um, so my first point was that both books utilize government-induced reformation methods to program its citizens to think a certain way. And I'm pretty sure everybody had that point. Um, I chose 1984 and A Clockwork Orange, by the way. So those are my two books that I'm comparing. And what I want to know, based on that point, is why do totalitarian governments believe that strict programming of their citizens is the solution to disturbances in the society, and at what point does the practice of reformation become unethical? So kind of two questions in that one. Um, my second point that you can actually see here is um, 1984 uses Winston's worst fear, rats, to transform him, while A Clockwork Orange tries to transform Alex by turning him against what he loves, which is violence. So um, one is fear, one is love, but um, the question that I asked off of that is, is transformation more effective when a person must face something that invokes a strong emotion? So fear and love are both strong emotions, so what role does that play in effectively transforming somebody? And then um, my third point, both books include the presence of a fake rebel group. So 1984 had Goldstein and the Brotherhood. And then in Clockwork Orange, F. Alexander in his manuscript to Clockwork Orange, um, he you know talked to Alex about the you know, they were going to get together an uprising, and he could join the rebels, and it was going to be great and everything. And, um, but he, it was all sort of a setup, because there wasn't, it didn't actually exist. And so Alex's, um, the false hope led Alex, you know, he tried to commit suicide by jumping out of that window. And then Winston is ultimately captured by the government. So um, it, it ultimately drives them to their own destruction when they realize that they can't. Um, that they don't have the support of a group. So that led me to ask, what to, to what degree does having the support of a group encourage revolutionary behavior? Is, that, is the belief in change enough to instigate a rebel faction against the government? Or does the government have to commit a terrible injustice before rebels will arise? So um, really, is, is, the mob, is mob mentality, I guess you could call it, um, how significant is that? Or, how far would the government have to go for there to just be, for a single person as an individual to want to change it enough to start a revolution? Or how many people do you have to have together to cause that to happen? My fourth point, in the transformation methods used in both of the novels, the protagonists were in pain and suffered greatly. So Winston was physically abused by being shocked um, when he would um, get the questions wrong. And then Alex was injected with a chemical to make him sick. So is it morally acceptable to cause a human to go through extreme suffering in order to transform them into a more, a more desirable being? So even though the end result is more desirable, um, you know, is it still acceptable to cause them to suffer physical pain to get there, um, especially if it's as extreme as it was in the books? Um, and then my final research point, in both novels, the protagonists were transformed to the extent that they could not commit crime again. Um, Winston's thoughts had been completely changed to abolish any rebel desires, and Alex became sick at the thought of violence. So which is the better person? A person who chooses to do bad when given free will, or a person who has been programmed to only do good and does not have free will? Who can be considered more human, and who deserves more sympathy from others? So the, the overall research question that I came up with is how essential is free will to being human and to what extent, if at all, can the government manipulate the human conscience without breaching morality? And then I said, I sort of came up with like a thesis statement, ultimately totalitarian governments violate human dignity and right to free will by pro programming their citizens to think and act a certain way. Um, they can also use propaganda to do that. Um, because part of being human is having free will and thus being able to make deliberate choices. In reforming human thoughts, especially through cruel, cruel punishment, the government does not necessarily make better humans because the humans are forced to do good rather than choosing it. 
So that's my whole idea there. actually thinking about this myself um, I I I think that that's kind of difficult because on the one hand you want to you want to feel bad that the person that can't choose they can't choose you know you mm -hmm. feel bad that they don't even they can't make that choice but then you could also feel bad that the person who can choose has chosen to do evil and like you know they have the choice and they messed up sort of a thing like you feel bad for them um, I actually would feel worse for the person without free will, though, because mm -hmm. a person who makes bad choices, you could always say, is mentally unstable, or maybe they don't have any desire to do good, or they're, you know, maybe they don't, you know, they wouldn't appreciate your sympathy or something. Whereas a person who can't make that choice at all, it's like, well, they don't, they don't know, you know, it's like they, they can't, you know they deserve the sympathy more because they can't choose at all. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Um, so you say when you say like human, obviously it's not in the biological standard because they're say, still considered human beings. Mm -hmm. But then what when you say the definition of human, what perspective are you like saying that? Um, I'm looking at it more of the, the human soul, like, um, Theolo yeah, theologically, yeah, because yeah, they're biological human, but um, part of being human, you know, there's more to being human than just the sh the shell, the body. I mean, you you make choices, and you know, I think that from a theological approach, they're not human if they can't, if they don't have free will, because that's not what God wanted for humans. Ms. Bill, do you have a question? What do you think is the farthest that government can go on punishing people without it being moral? Well, I think that sometimes physical pain might be necessary to get them, you know, to make it serious enough. Because if you just sit there and like preach to them, it's like they may not, you know, if you don't do anything to directly affect them, then it may not have an effect at all. Um, but I don't know if it's necessarily worth going to all the trouble to like fix someone who who may not be fixable anyway. You know, I don't I don't necessarily believe that everybody can be fixed. Um, I think that there are people who, no matter what you do, are still going to act out and commit crimes. And so, um, you have something there? Are you done? Yeah. Well, Where do you draw the line if a person can be fixed or not? Where do you draw the line? Yeah. 
Um, I think certain mental illnesses can contribute to that. Um, that there are mental states, people who like, like people who are serial killers, like they, they don't have, they actually don't have a, like the part of their brain that um, focuses on like sympathy and like emotions and like feeling guilty or feeling bad for somebody is actually biologically smaller than in the brains of um, normal humans. So they, it's like, what, what good is it gonna do to try and transform them if they're biologically missing part of their brain that causes them to act that way, you know? So who, who gets, I'm sorry, um, who gets to choose then, like, if this person is able to be fixed or, like, this other person? Um, well, it, it's ultimately up to the people, I guess, I mean, the government who is in charge of, you know, like, capital punishment and, like, um, prisons and stuff like that, they, they are not, you know, hopefully they're smart enough to know that, but you never know, like, it, it kind of comes down to who we elect, like, who gets to be in charge, you know, like, everybody has to be knowledgeable to a point where we can elect people that are going to make the right decisions. Well, you just brought, brought it back to biological standpoint when like people go beyond. But um, what about in a theological standpoint? Uh, God created as they are, like psychopaths. Well, they're mostly they were born like that. So if you believe in the theological point, why would God create it the way they are? Then like you think they're not going to be fixed? Well, I believe that God creates makes evil in the world because it's almost like a test for the people who aren't, you know. It's not so much that God doesn't, I mean, God is against evil, but there has to be that evil for there to be good or else you don't have a standard. So it's like... So they're like possessed by the devil? Not, not possessed by the devil, but I mean, if they're biologically missing, I mean, if if, if their brain is not, does not relate to normal human emotions as if a normal person's brain would, obviously they're, I mean, they're going to make bad choices. I mean, they don't have to be possessed by the devil to do that. Um, so one of the things that you brought up in your, like, statement after your question was how propaganda affects people. So in what way do you think propaganda, like, like, steps over a limit to where it's actually like debilitating towards people where they can't think for themselves. Because um, I think propaganda, actually the influence of propaganda depends on the state of the society itself because if people are desperate or if they're like particularly in need of something, um, like in sort of a desperate state like the Soviet Russia, like in Child 44, they're probably more prone to um, listen to propaganda that may not have as strong of an effect if they're more self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. So it kind of depends on the desperation of the society. I think that the more desperate they are, the easier it's going to be for propaganda to influence them. Okay. So going to the question where you're asking if it's morally acceptable to sort of forcibly change a human being, but these people who you say are beyond the point of redemption cannot be fixed. The mo what would you say is the morally acceptable action in handling those people? Um, I'm trying not to say anything like super controversial. I don't. <laughs> I don't know. Like I. I, mean, I honestly. I, I'm okay with saying I don't know necessarily what exactly needs to be done, but I do know that if you try and it, treat those people as if you would somebody who does, who is not biologically unstable like that, that it's not going to have the same effect. So, but I mean, if you're, if from a government perspective, if you're a government trying to get rid of this um, problem, then I don't necessarily think, I mean, last class we were discussing, and it kind of changed my view a little bit, because when I wrote this, I was sort of thinking like, um, just that it was, you know, immoral and wrong and everything, but then I started thinking like, 
if you, from a government perspective, what else can you do, you know, if you have somebody like that and you're trying your best to come up with ways to reform them and you just can't. It's like sometimes you might have to do something immoral. And to me, then it sounds as if your best solution to that is capital punishment. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm not against capital punishment, but I think that it should be very, um, it should be supervised and not, you know, just like, oh, death sentence, death sentence. It should be very limited and very, it has to be certain that this is the only way to deal with this person. And then, and then I believe it might be the right thing to do. So. So would you say it's morally acceptable what the um, government did in Clockwork Orange to Alex? Because like he has like no remorse and like he's literally not really capable of it. So like, would you say in that situation, going off of like what we've said, it's acceptable for what they did? I think in Clockwork Orange specifically, I don't necessarily think the government was that wrong because that is a case where they're like, what else do we do? I mean, it's like, yeah. In their, from their point of view, um, they're just trying something out. You know, they don't know. I mean, Alex may have been the first test, and to us it seems super wrong because he was like the test victim. But to them, it's like, well, we need to try it on somebody at some point. So let's try. You know, we're going to try it, and we're going to see if it works. And we don't know what else to do. So I don't think they were entirely wrong for doing that. Wait, so. Um like the treatments that Winston and Alex went through kind of like took away their like humanity in a way. And it's like I think it kind of like imprisons their soul like permanently because they're like incapable of making any wrong decision. So if they're like killed in that sense, is it better to is it like our version of capital punishment better than like killing their emotions and like I don't think that killing someone is necessarily better than well because if well if you look at it from the government's perspective they're happy that the person has now does what they want basically and so yeah it's morally wrong but and the government in fact is corrupt and so they that's why they believe that that's right um, but if it, would it be better to kill someone than to have them their humanity taken away? Yeah. Um, I'm gonna say no, um, because I still think that I don't know. I still think that you know, even if you are living, I mean, if you personally don't feel like you're miserable, and you know, like Winston didn't necessarily feel miserable. You know, he was, you know, he'd been transformed, and he was. He may have not been able to think the same thoughts he did before, but he was not, he was, you know, I don't, I don't know if he was content, but he wasn't miserable. And so, in a way, that's not violating his, you know, like, if, if he felt, if he was miserable, like, like an animal in suffering, like a dog that you have to put to sleep, that's one thing. But, you know, he was, he was okay with it, and I think that that is better than killing him. In kind of like in response to your question, also like Winston, like it, I think it isn't better to have killed him because Winston, like he didn't want to die, like when, like the reason he, I don't think he wanted to die, like he, he started to say what the government wanted him to say, and he started to do all these things. I think because he didn't want to be tortured anymore, and he wanted to like get out. So like he didn't want to lose his life. So I think it's better that they, that he didn't end up losing his life, like. Yeah, well, the standard way, of his life is better afterwards, I don't know, but like, he didn't want to lose his life. I mean, you can say he got what he wanted, but if to us, as a third person point of view, it seems immoral just because of what we think about morality. But in the, in the characters in the book itself, I mean, he's fine. So, like, according to our standards today, Winston didn't really do anything wrong. He just, like, had ideas that contradicted the government. So... Was the government justified in punishing him the way they did and like to the extent that they did? Well, I think that if you're at that point, if you have a government, I guess it all comes down to like standards. 
I mean, if you, in our society today, that's unthinkable because we have free speech and, and you know, all that. But if you commit direct acts like murder and like, if you, if you commit murder, yeah, you're going to be punished. And you would be punished in this society too. But I think that the government has such strict control that they feel like, in, like that they feel like if Winston did start like a movement that more people would start to fall out of their shell and then it would start a revolution and that's what they're afraid of ultimately I think. Do you think that the like entity that manipulates the human conscience like matters in the situation of whether it gets good or bad? Because when you grow up you don't really have a formed conscience and so you rely on other people in order to learn what's right and what's wrong. So is it necessarily just the fact that the government is what's doing it that we think it's bad? I mean, because our parents influence us in a way that forms our conscience. So is that wrong too, or? So like parents, it, like it's okay for parents, but wrong for the government? Yeah. Um, I think it kind of depends, like, I guess that that's something that's gonna really depend based person to person. Like, for I mean, for me, I think, I mean, if, you, if you're a person who, like, sees the government as, like, bad and you, like, don't want them to, like, intervene and everything, and you, and then, yeah, you would probably consider that more severe than if you're a person who thinks that the government is, like, helps people and is, like, really good and everything. Um, but I think anybody in reading these books can tell that the government is supposed to be viewed as bad. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the author's intent. Um, mm -hmm. So whether you, I mean, he, the authors try to portray it so that you can see that the government's supposed to be bad, mm -hmm. but he could have written it from another perspective and written it um, like the people are all evil and the government's just trying to do its best to keep that under control. And if, he, if the authors had tried to do it from that perspective, we might have totally different opinions. So I think it just depends on how well the author can put that in the text.